So good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is uh, Alan Thompson. I'm uh, Dean of the Faculty of Brain Sciences. And my role today is to welcome you to UCL Mind's lunchtime lecture and to introduce uh, our speaker. And that's Tony David, who is the director of the Institute of Mental Health here at UCL. So Tony was appointed to the new Institute of Mental Health. I meant to use this microphone, haven't I? Uh, probably, uh, I, I, not that I really need it, but I think that maybe it's a little louder now. So Tony was um, direct, uh, appointed director of the Institute of Mental Health at UCL in 2018. That's just last year. So this is an institute which is bringing together not just psychiatry, but neurology, and neuroscience, and psychology to really drive this critically important area forward. And Tony comes with, with, with great credentials. Prior to this, he was vice dean of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience, KCL, or IOP, as we used to call it in the old days, uh, which, of course, is uh, across the river, but that's OK. And we work very closely together. He qualified in medicine from Glasgow University and trained in psychiatry at the Maudsley Hospital London and is an academic and practicing clinician with an interest in neuropsychiatry and brain imaging. So he's published very widely, 600 scientific papers, and has co-edited several books, including Insight and Psychosis, and The Self in Neuroscience and Psychiatry. And for those of you who are, who are interested, his forthcoming book, which is a rather, rather interesting title, Into the Abyss, uh, which is a collection of neuropsychiatric case histories. So look out for that. I think it's going to be around early early Thank next you. year. So Tony, you're more than welcome. I look forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you. Thanks very much. I've got... Okay, thank you very much, Alan, for that very nice introduction, and thanks for coming today. So it is World Mental Health Day, uh, as it so happens, so I think it's a good time to talk about what we understand as mental health, um, the labels that are used and the way it's discussed publicly. In particular, there's a lot of talk about stigma attached to mental health or mental illness and campaigns that aim to reduce stigma. Uh, and I'm going to focus on those in particular today. How effective are they? Are they actually helping the problem? Are they in perhaps even making it slightly worse? Um, without meaning to. So, anti-stigma campaigns in mental health, winning the battle but losing the war. So, how is mental health portrayed in the media? Here are a few uh, egregious examples of uh, terrible headlines. Um, this one here, Bonkers Bruno locked up, referring to the, 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 the British boxer Frank Bruno and his um, mental illness. And quite interestingly, if we concentrate on that, um, this was the Sun um, front page, 2003. Um, but within the day, that the, 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 due to a sort of public outcry, uh, they published a different front page, slightly better, arguably. Sad Bruno in mental home, hero sectioned. A little bit better than bonkers Bruno, but still a lot to be desired. Um, still Pamela Anderson, though, going from a double whammy to bigger than ever. I'm not sure whether that was really an improvement one way or the other. But that was a kind of turning point, because after that, um, I think... We've seen a lot of very positive messages coming out from the media, and particularly a lot of very well-known personalities uh, talking about their own health uh, and their own experiences in very often a very um, understanding and compassionate way. OK, so what is stigma? This is one definition, the mark of disgrace associated with a particular circumstance, quality or person. People who here are much more expert in sociology will immediately know this classic text by Irving Goffman on stigma. And this is his uh, characteristically forthright definition. 
The Greeks, who were apparently strong on visual aids, originated the term stigma to refer to bodily signs designed to expose something unusual and bad about the moral status of the signifier. The signs were cut or burnt into the body and advertised that the bearer was a slave, a criminal or a traitor, a blemished person, polluted to be avoided in public places. But when we talk about stigma, we, we tend to have a broader idea that it's to do with ignorance, prejudice and discrimination. And a recent uh, editorial in the British Journal of Psychiatry defines stigma as occurring in a complex mesh of relationships involving labeling, stereotyping, separation, status loss, discrimination and power imbalances. So in fact, the working definition of public stigma is that it refers to members of the general public endorsing negative stereotypes and discriminating against people with mental illness. And then there's the allied but very important construct of self-stigma. And this occurs when people with mental illness internalize negative stereotypes and that leads to diminished self-esteem, self-efficacy, demoralization, etc. Okay, so anti-stigma and anti-stigma campaigns do come, come in. So I'm taking these headings from an article by Patrick Corrigan, who's a very well-known psychologist from the States who's worked on, on this. Uh, he himself has had experience of, uh, of mental illness. So he divides the ways that you combat stigma into three broad approaches, Edu to educate and inform, to promote contact or proximity with the stigmatized group, and then more recently, activism, as it were, coming from the grassroots, empowering people to, to make their own case, to say what they have to say. So I'm going to take these in turn, concentrating mostly on number one, education and information. So what this amounts to is really the bulk of the anti-stigma campaigns. And it's about putting out there what you might call facts, but it's probably more accurately described as rhetoric around mental illness and mental health. It's about challenging stereotypes and myths, changing the vocabulary, and two particular uh, approaches. One has been to emphasize how common, how ubiquitous mental illness is, such as the one in four campaign, which I'm going to talk about, and also to promote a sort of medical model that it's a disease like any other. And those have been very prominent approaches to uh, reducing stigma. And we'll have a look at their relative success or failure. So, of course, language is very important. And I think we tend, we now... Our consciousness has been raised so that we don't hear these sorts of very pejorative words quite so often, quite so publicly, but of course they still are, still are around. There are, of course, lots of less pejorative terms that we use, and mental health has become the sort of dominant one, rightly, for good or ill. And here's a cartoon showing that it's not that easy We've moved on from the bad old days when mental health problems were just labeled mad. But does anyone really want that as their label? So in terms of other conditions, sometimes giving the condition the name of a person who discovered or contributed to it, as in Down syndrome, I can't even bring myself to say the condition that used to be called Alzheimer's disease for, for cases of dementia, just saying those terms feels much more natural and positive than dementia. And schizophrenia, well, we don't talk about schizophrenics anymore, quite rightly. People with schizophrenia is a more acceptable term, but even then, people don't like it. Psychosis seems a little bit preferable. Um, and in Japan, they've ditched the, the, the term altogether and created their new... Japanese term, which I, I was, I'm afraid I don't speak Japanese, but I'm told that it translates something like integration disorder. And we could go down that route 
with Bloiler syndrome, the Swiss psychiatrist who coined the term schizophrenia or some kind of mechanistic description, dopamine dysregulation syndrome, would that be better? Would that reduce stigma? But the thing about mental health I worry about is when, when do we get to a point where we're not just avoiding stigma, but we're avoiding problems altogether, and that these terms become euphemisms. So we are always talking about mental health issues or problems. I don't see why mental illness is a stigmatizing term or psychiatric illness or psychiatric disorder. In fact, many clinicians here will know we will often have patients coming to us saying, I've got mental health, doctor. And that's sort of just become a euphemism for all sorts of other words that are less easy to express, like problem. So there have been campaigns to address the stigma of mental illness. They, these are global campaigns. Almost every country has had them. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on probably the, the biggest one, which was our own UK Time to Change campaign. There may be people here uh, who were involved with those. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Graham Thornicroft from the Morsley, uh, led them. I've discussed this with him and we've argued about it, but he, he's quite happy for, for me to, to uh, um, challenge some of the ideas. So the Time to Change campaign finished in around about 2013-14, and it was a 20 million pound research project, largely funded through the National Lottery, but other sources as well. And it was primarily a marketing campaign to address public attitudes. And this is from their own summary, that they found that attitudes were an intended behavior improved as a result of their uh, three-year campaign. But they found that making contact with individuals is more effective. Uh, in one of the sub-studies, they found that fewer users of mental health services experienced discrimination. But look at the change. It goes from 91% to 88%. Hardly something to really write home about. They did look at newspaper coverage. I'm going to go on to that in a second from what we saw at the beginning. And that showed some changes. And there was a sub-study on medical students. I think there's some here today. Uh, it was called Education, Not Discrimination. And it showed the students' attitudes, the future doctors' attitudes to psychiatry improved, but it was a rather short-term change, didn't last. So looking at their newspaper coverage, so they, they had armies of people going through headlines and newspapers uh, over these different years from 2008 to 2011. And you can see that classifying the articles, the most common kind of article in the newspapers was classified as stigmatizing. That was the most common type, followed by anti-stigmatizing. And you can see that the change brought about or coinciding with the campaign was an increase in anti-stigmatizing articles. So that's good at the expense of neutral ones. But, it, but the stigmatizing articles remain the most common kind of article. Now, they've gone back and done another wave of survey, 2016, and found quite gratifyingly that the anti-stigmatizing campaigns now outnumber stigmatizing, sorry, articles in, in, in British newspapers. So, that has an effect, whether that's been due to the campaign or other things that have happened at the same time or a bit of both, can't really say. Uh, but there's still a lot of st stigmatizing articles uh, being published. And some of the research that came out of that campaign, I'll, don't worry about the details, but basically, again, they had a, a, a group of people they surveyed, a sort of representative group of people in the UK, about 1,700 people. And they gave them various questionnaires about attitudes, um, knowledge of mental illness, and the desire to be distant or close to people with mental health problems. And essentially, everything has improved over that time. Uh, but interestingly, other work has sort of come out looking at 
uh, help seeking in relation to stigma. And I'll, I'll just, in a nutshell, the less stigma there is about the place, there's more help seeking. So again, whether that's a bad or a good thing or it's, it's uncovering uh, hidden problems, it definitely means that when you attack stigma, when you reduce stigma, you get more people coming forward seeking help. And that leads to the next issue. Uh, how many people out there actually do have mental health problems? It seems to be an inordinate proportion. Uh, you'll have heard about this one in four statistic, which gets banded around quite a lot. Uh, where does that actually come from? Um, it seems to come from this adult psychiatric morbidity survey, which is a very, very um, respected and useful survey that people like Lynn Lewis have been involved in in the past. Uh, but this is actually what it shows, uh, and that, that it was when people in the community were asked about, in the last month, did they suffer from depression, anxiety, etc., according to fairly well-defined uh, criteria, well, this adds up to somewhat less than one in four, more like sort of between one in five and one in six. And it's only when you sort of lump in things which were over the last month or maybe are ongoing in the background that you start to get up to one in four or even more. So it's not quite clear where the one in four statistic comes from. One of the questions asked in the survey was, are you on antidepressant medication? And I think the percentage was something like 26%. So that's one in four. But then a lot of those people would hopefully be doing well and not have any symptoms due to their treatment. Others perhaps would still be suffering. So the one in four statistic is, I think, problematic. And it just does seem a little bit too high. Um, it can have the effect that if, if so many people are being called as having a mental health problem, then could the problem really be that bad? If a quarter of the people in this room have a mental illness, not just symptoms, um, maybe it's not so serious after all. And that, I think, obviously is a bad message and an incorrect inference. But when in, in, in trying to show that these problems are ubiquitous, we might be actually worsening the stigma. The other idea is that it's all part of a continuum. We're all a little bit mad. We've all got those symptoms. And this has prompted some very good research. And there are different ways to display it. Sometimes you can say, well, some scales, most people have no symptoms, but then there's no real cutoff between people who have a lot of symptoms or other questionnaires that show that most people are in the middle uh, and very few are scoring at the very high or low end. Um, hearing voices is a good way to go. And I, if anyone was at the talk uh, two days ago, Sophia Demjan was talking about this. So there are people, of, people who identify themselves as voice hearers who don't believe they have a mental illness and aren't under any treatment. And their voices sound very much like the auditory hallucinations that people with schizophrenia describe. But when you look in more detail, there are differences in terms of whether the voices perceived as, as coming from outside or not. And most people with the, the non-clinical voice hearers tend to think that the voice is a spiritual guide, that it's helpful, that it's positive. They never think it's due to a device implanted in my brain. Now, only a small number of people with schizophrenia think that. But no one ever th who says that uh, has an, a non-clinical voice hearing state. So there are actual differences when you go into the, the detail. Now you can also look at that, that from a, an experimental point of view. This idea is, is mental distress a category or is it just part of a continuum? And so this was an experiment where people read vignettes that were designed to make you think in terms of categories or continua. So for example, here's a, the top vignette is the, a continuum one. It's, it's about a guy who has uh, mental health problems, a mental illness, but he's not very different from others who are considered healthy. He's gone to work, he's intelligent, 
but he hears voices, sometimes believes that the CIA is investigating him, and says, there's no clear boundary between my experiences and beliefs and those of most people. For example, hallucinations and delusions can happen to anyone. Most people get nervous at some time in their life, and like me, anyone may be hospitalized. So cleverly, the, the experiment has designed a, a vignette which sounds very similar, but has different, builds in this categorical idea that these symptoms are very different from what other people experience. There is a clear boundary between my experiences and beliefs of other people, which don't happen to others. And unlike me, very few people get hospitalized. So it's still sympathetic, but it's saying this is different. So what did they find? Well, in the, 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 the people who they studied, who are just ordinary people reading these vignettes, if they read the categorical vignettes, they tended to endorse a categorical view of mental illness. If they read the continuum vignettes, they tended to see mental illness on a continuum. So the, the intervention worked. It, it did shape people's ideas. But when they tested them indirectly for stigmatizing beliefs, which is over here, Jim is a 30-year-old man with schizophrenia. How dangerous do you think he would be? It didn't really affect how dangerous they thought he would be. It didn't affect that and other stigmatizing questions, whether or not they were in the categorical or continuum group. What did make a difference was another, another intervention, which was whether they had contact with people with men mental illness. And that's something I'll come back to. So what about this other idea? It's an illness like any other. And here's a, an example of the campaign. You never say, it's just cancer, get over it. Why do we say that to people with depression? Very powerful uh, idea. But again, this has been studied with a very large survey in the US where this disease like any other was a national campaign. And to cut a long story short, they surveyed people in 1996 and then a decade later to see what effect it had on various parameters. And so here is, do people think that um, schizophrenia, depression is a mental illness, a chemical imbalance, genetic? All, all of, for all of these con conditions, there was a shift over that decade to people thinking, yes, these are more these are actual illnesses and not so much bad character or just ups and downs. So it had an effect on people understanding the seriousness of the conditions. And it also had other implications. They thought that doctors should treat these conditions, psychiatrists, although they didn't think psychiatrists should necessarily treat schizophrenia, but they did think that those people should be in a mental hospital. But they felt all of those conditions might respond to medication. But when they asked questions like, well, would you like your son or daughter to marry a person with mental illness? Or do you socialize with those sorts of people? Or are they violent? It was all over the place. There hadn't been any shift in what we would consider a positive, less stigmatizing direction. So the disease, like any other, does shape our attitudes a little bit, but it doesn't seem to make us less stigmatizing. So it doesn't seem to work. OK, so that's education and information. What about this idea that I've alluded to, promoting contact or proximity? Well, this has been known, this is known as the human relations movement and has been applied across lots of different states and conditions in terms of people from different ethnic groups, from different levels of education, nationalities. How do, we, how do we get to live together more peaceably? Well, if we're in contact every day, we see that we're all human beings under the skin. And this is a meta-analysis of a load of studies. It's, it's uh, quite old now, but it's a really good one because they've compared uh, in, uh, promoting contact between people on the effect of prejudice for people of different sexual orientations, ra ra racial or ethnic groups, nationalities, etc. This one in the middle, that's mental illness. And this is the 
effect size of the intervention. So how effective is it promoting contact in promoting better attitudes? And so this effect size of about 0.3 is between a small and moderate effect. Uh, so it's a small and mod moderate effect. If you get people to engage with their neighbors, get to know them better. So it's not massive, but it's very consistent and arguably better than just trying to educate and inform people. Here's an example. Uh, this is from, from the village of Kiel, which is in Belgium, and the story of St. Dymphna. So she was uh, from the 7th century, 7th century Ireland. She consecrated herself to Christ and took a vow of chastity. Unfortunately, her mother died, and her father, Damon, who loved him, her deeply, and in the aftermath of his wife's death, his health deteriorated. The king was summoned and said he needs to remarry, he needs to get over it. Damon agreed, but on the condition that he would be found a bride who is as beautiful as his deceased wife. Ah, oh. so it sounds very sweet. After searching fruitlessly, Damon began to desire his daughter because of her strong resemblance to her mother. So not at all sweet, in fact, rather creepy. <laughs> he goes after her. She runs away to Belgium, and she, she builds a hospice for the care of the sick. Damon, the father, traveled there and tried to force his daughter to return to Ireland, but she resisted. Furious, he took out his sword and cut off her head, and she was martyred. She was only 15. Years later, they built a church honoring St. Dymphna in, in Heel, and it became a place of pilgrimage, and people seeking succor and treatment for their mental health problems went there, and it became a sanctuary for the mad. There were so many people, it overflowed the church, and it became the responsibility of the village. So a tradition of care was built up that, the, that remains to the present day. So the people are taken in by people in the village, they're called boarders rather than patients, and they're treated just like any other. And so that's the church of St. Dymphna, and this is a photograph from the, I think from the 1940s, people looking a bit bemused. And then um, that's the old infirmary, and here's a modern new health center that uh, we'd, we'd be quite proud of if it was uh, in Camden. Okay, so we've talked about education and information, promoting proximity. The third thing that Patrick Corrigan mentioned was activism. What does that mean? Well, it's positive statements. It's positive uh, endorsement of whatever the state happens to be. And they talk about sanism in the, way, in the same way we might talk about racism. So if we promote being sane over being, as it were, insane, it's just like being racist. And we have very radical discussions on the UN, uh, on the UN about the Convention of the Rights of the Persons with Disabilities, who are going against any kind of supported decision-making for people with mental health problems. It's all to do with this idea, no decision about us without us, which of course sounds laudable, but if you take it to an extreme, uh, it might have undue consequences. And then I think you're something also you hear, especially in the health system, parity of esteem. Why is it that only a fifth of the research budget goes towards mental health compared to physical health? Why are there no big charities for schizophrenia and depression? Uh, why is it our health services don't get uh, nearly enough resources? Uh, and of course you can make legislation to be anti-discriminatory, but uh, that's a very slow process. But the activism is more about fostering pride, this idea that I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take any more of this. And so these are slightly different campaigns. They're anti-stigma campaigns, but they're more grassroots. They're, they're, they're slightly more aggressive, if you like. Think of the Extinction Rebellion that's going on. It's not about just trying to make the case. It's about being more strident. I'm, I'm mentally ill and I'm proud of it. 
and I can identify with, with this one here. Reclaiming some pejorative terms <laughs> to be less pejorative. Okay. And I think Carrie Fisher, the late Carrie Fisher, was a staunch a, um, proponent of this. I am mentally ill. I can say that. I'm not ashamed of that. I've survived it. I'm still surviving it. Alas, she isn't, but bring it on. Okay, so I hope we can have a discussion around that. Is this, are these anti-stigma campaigns, are they, are they going along the right track? May they actually worsen stigma? What should we do differently? Are we focusing on the wrong issues? As a, should we be talking more about improving services rather than improving attitudes? Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Tony. Really stimulating, interesting, challenging. Uh, I'm sure there are some uh, comments, questions from the audience. And what I'm going to ask you to do is just wait until a, a microphone comes to you, and then we can, so everybody can hear you and you are streamed and all the other things we're doing today. Um. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. My name is Bettina Friedrich. I used to work on the evaluation of Time to Change, also south of the river, but I also found the way to the light and came to UCL. Absolutely. <laughs> wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> and uh, I worked on the evaluation of um, educational discrimination, and we did also qualitative interviews, which unfortunately we didn't come around publishing. But what I found interesting is when we interviewed the medical students, we learned that it wasn't really a big attitude change. It was really that people learned to know what to say. This is why we found short-term changes, but not long-term. I don't really think mm. it had such a, um, a massive impact. Um, and uh, one thing I also wanted to say about this uh, one out of four, I find this really difficult because it's really a bit trivializing mental ill health because one out of four might sense some kind of mild distress or, or mild symptoms, but that has nothing to do with how we stigmatize people who, for example, will never be able to work in nine psychiatric beds all of their lives. So this is why I'm a bit critical, mm. um, and I know Time to Change has used that also quite a lot. And the last point I wanted to make is just from my experience, I've worked on several evaluation of several campaigns, and I worked with the Global Anti-Stigma Alliance, and I w uh, wrote the newsletter is uh, I do think campaigning, like everything that has an impact can also worsen things. And I think we really have to be careful, and I do think it can increase mental health stigma. Especially, um, I found in some campaigns, uh, people with mental health problems, service users, are um, proactively encouraged to show their anger, which in a way is about how it is to be discriminated, which in a way I understand, and we also measured that, and it shows like people feel more empowered if they do this. But then again, anger is not always the best way to get your message across. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate that you also these, see this critically, and I think it should be discussed. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much for those comments. Tony, do you have any uh, comments well, to make back other than agree? Th thank you for, for that and for that inside uh, knowledge. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're saying this one in four, what does it really mean? Is it helpful? Is it not helpful? And your point about people learning just to use different language without it really changing their minds, uh, I, I think that's also very an interesting idea because maybe using the language enough changes your mind whether you want it to or not. Um, I don't know, I don't know. But, but perhaps merely saying we've got to use different words <laughs> without anything else behind it, that's clearly not going to be enough. No, no. Good question here and then another one here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering if any research had been done on how people with mental illnesses feel about the anti-stigmatizing campaigns. Mm. So yeah. I was thinking about kind of the medical model and the whole um, proud to be mentally ill. I wonder whether that might, um, if there's any chance that might kind of prevent a recovery model because people mm -hmm. are identifying positively with their illness kind of yeah. identity. Yeah. Um, yeah, great question. And I mean, I think one of the, one of the th things about discrimination, 
uh, and prejudice is that you see a group as, of people as all being the same. And the, the first step is realizing that, you know, we, everybody's unique and different. So one of the things is not to assume that patients or service users all think the same. And uh, there's, a, there's a great debate about this disease type, disease like any other model. Some people think that really is the way to go. Others really hate it. And uh, they think it's very d damaging and destructive. So there are, there are lots of opinions even within the sort of communities where it really matters. So I, I, I think what, what we can do as, as researchers is trying to get evidence to what these kind of campaigns do and how they change attitudes. And then, you know, it's up to people to take that further. Okay, thank you for that. Question here and then we'll come down. Here. Yep. Um, I think sort of similarly going on from the last question. Um, it, so it's kind of like a comment is that what I always found very confusing, if you could shed some light on it, is the boundary between anti-stigmatizing and trivializing because it's like on one side there's that medical module which says that you know we should be discussing this as a disease like any other so, so as to not make like oh this is something so horrible but then of course there's also which I've personally experienced a lot is the trivial use of the word the names of diseases for example say OCD depression anxiety uh, bipolar syndrome like they're used in a common daily sense which I mean I find really scary of how anybody speaks about wanting a notebook in a way as their OCD not realizing the actual meaning so where exactly can even somebody trying to study mm. draw that line between yeah yeah I, I i agree i think autism particularly is a word that's suddenly become gone from being very misunderstood hidden to being perhaps overused um and and here i think autism spectrum is actually a very useful thing rather than because i think you speak to especially families who look after a person with autism who uh, it seems to be so uh, cut off and distressed, unable to communicate at all, uh, um, is a very, very different situation to a person who's got you know, slightly unusual beliefs, who uh, doesn't necessarily want to do the same things as their peers. I think uh, to mix those up and to presume they're the same thing can be quite damaging. Okay, another question here, and then we have one just here. And Hi, here. my name is Moira. Moira. I'm just a member of the public, really, here out of interest, but I really enjoyed your lecture because I think it picked up on some of the things that I've been thinking anyway in terms of um, some of the campaigns that have been happening. Mm -hmm. And there's a new campaign that's just been launched by the four, apparently. <laughs> um, but it was very interesting because the woman over there, she, she mentioned the recovery mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And you sort of said, well, you know, we can't assume that all patients or service users feel the same. Mm -hmm. And within the activism, there was a very, very strong activism against the recovery model mm -hmm. because a lot of service users feel that it's a kind of government effort to say, well, go and have a hot bath, light a candle, you'll be fine and get on with it. And, and so it's a sort of way to, if you like, hide, behind, hide the fact mm. that the services aren't there. So it's very much a sort of do-it-yourself kind of mm. whatever. Um, and, and there is a really good website, I don't know if anyone's ever read it, called Recovery in the Bin. And that is an activism website that sort of argues that partly it's the social model, like with disability, that counts. Mm. But also, I think, just sort of saying that the other thing it highlights is how even within mental health services themselves, there is stigma that the mental health professionals mm. attach to different labels. You put up mm. earlier personality disorder. Mm. And for a lot of people, that is the kiss of death particularly with mental health professionals, because they say it's untreatable and they're all mm. difficult, manipulative, and all this mm. sort of stuff. So, you know, the whole question of stigma is not just about the public, but it is within the mental health yeah. system itself as well. Yeah. Thank no, you. No, I think you make some excellent po points. Don't apologize for being a member of the public. They're supposed to be public lectures. We're all, we're all, but, we're, we're all actually members but, of the public. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I work as a GP locally, but I did train in psychiatry south of the river a long time ago. 
And one of the things that made the biggest impression ever was um, the study that showed that people in developing or low-income countries had a better prognosis for their mental mm -hmm. health, particularly their serious mental health illnesses. And I think that's not been regarded enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would be advocating very strongly for your middle argument of, and your Belgian model of people living within the community. Yeah. I think we really let people down with care in the community and how it's currently mm -hmm. implemented. Yeah. Yeah, just you. point to it. Yeah, yeah I, I think I, I, I think there's this idea of the proximity and living together seems to have less downsides than some of the other approaches. So I think that that is something. My my view would be to try and promote that and develop that further. One more question here, and, and, the, and then one here. Fine, very good. And then was there somebody here? Yep. I think that's probably we probably be drawing to a closer. That was great, Finn. So a lot of the stigma seems to come from self-preservation. So viewing, as you said, people with schizophrenia as a threat to oneself. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the implications for anti-stigma campaigns then, you could almost take it from an angle of, okay, well, how undangerous is this person or how do you um, deal with them properly to help alleviate their symptoms? It is that sort of self-centered angle of an anti-stigma campaign, does that in your view, would that reassert some of the stigma that's coming from it, that angle? Or is it better to, I guess as you said when you gave the continuum model as well, mm -hmm. um, focusing more on assimilating and mm -hmm. highlighting differences not so much? Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I think that the idea of people with mental illness are violent is a, just a very fo a common uh, misconception, as it turns out. So. So I think part of the education and inform has become rhetorical, as I was arguing, and saying it's a disease like any other isn't a matter of fact necessarily, it's a sort of way of looking at it. Whereas you can say, well, what proportion of murders are committed by people with mental illness? And, you know, it's tiny. And people are often saying you're much more likely to be a victim of violence than a perpetrator of violence if you have a mental illness. So they're, they're actual proper facts that you can put out there, which hopefully will dispel some of that. But, but yeah, taking the perspective of the person in the street versus the sufferer, if you like, uh, it does require a different kind of nuance. Yep. Yeah. Can get this to work. Um, so, moving on to the, the second point about focusing on promoting proximity rather than education. Um, I actually just wanted to put something out here. Um, as somebody that has suffered from mental health and still does, I think education is really <coughs> important, but not necessarily just destigmatizing, but just basic education. So in the same way that you think about your physical health as something that you've got a measure of control of, you can eat well, you can protect that. Why don't we talk about and start conversations about mental health mm -hmm. in the same way? Because I think a big factor in recovering from mental health, or at least managing it, is feeling that you've got some control over it. So if we start that from an earlier age, sort of educating people that mental health is something that you do have some control of, but like physical, you know, physical ailments, you can develop mental health mm -hmm. problems. That's it, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. But I just think I would really like us to start looking at basic education and talking about mm -hmm. mental health on the same level as we talk about physical health. Okay. Yeah, that's a very, very fair point. And I think we are trying to do that, especially in universities, that we're talking about mental health and well-being. In that way, it's not, it, it, it's not trying to overly medicalize uh, problems, but just make it part of the way you look after yourself. So I very much agree. Yeah. Thank you. So I think our l last question for the lunchtime. Um, I just wanted to ask about that final point, so um, whether we're looking at the wrong issues mm. and thinking about services, um, and like what this lady said here, in terms of all of these anti-stigma campaigns are obviously in some ways working and people are thinking about mental health a lot more, but that means that more people are coming forward for treatment and for support, and given the cuts to the NHS, how do we then take this forward? Is mm. all this anti-stigma work actually causing more problems in terms of giving people, uh, give it, giving our country more people to treat when and leaving mm. people with more severe difficulties mm. without services? And I wonder yeah. what your view was on that. Yeah, well, I, I, I suppose I'm a bit biased as a, as a psychiatrist. I tend to feel that uh, 
Um, we should start with the people with the most severe problems. And uh, whether or not those problems shade into normal or not, you know, that's, that's an interesting question for debate. But, but within my profession, there are others that say, well, you can perhaps do more good for more people by not concentrating on the, the sickest. Uh, because there's more people who are sort of in the middle. So again, that's, that's a bit of a debate to be had about how best to use resources. But I think the people the most severely affected uh, are the people who have the least voice. So I think professionals do have to sort of speak up for them where the activism is not strong enough. Great. Tony, I thank you very much. I'd just like to thank Professor David for his lecture, which was clearly very stimulating, and to thank you for all your questions, which are great. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.